Keep on your list at night. So, we co-host a new show called News on the Flip Side. You can catch us every Saturday night, 8 p.m. Central, where we will be discussing current events and topics going on in the world today. We have opinions on everything. There's no topic that we won't discuss, and we'll go places that other shows wouldn't dare. False history gets made all day, every day. The truth of the new is never on the news, but you can catch it here. News on the flip side. Only on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. Welcome to another episode of the Dawn of Shades. I'm your host, Gia Scott, and once again, we've got a fascinating topic ahead. But before we jump off into that conversation, we've got our usual announcements to make. For tonight's show, like always, I would love to hear from the listening audience. So, please send your questions and comments to me at giascott at exogenynetwork.com. You don't need to worry that I'm going to give you an email address out over the air and I'm not going to spam you forever and ever either. I just don't have time for that, so it won't ever happen. And, and I never give anyone's full name out either. So, don't be shy. I know that you'll have something on your mind that you would love to have the answer to. Now, for tonight, our guest is Claudia Delaire. So, without further ado... Claudia, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the audience, as well as give a, maybe a little taste of your books that are available to purchase? I would be happy to, Chia. I love coming on your show. <laughs> my, name is, <laughs> my name is Claudia Delaire, and I am the author of three books on Egyptian magical practices. Uh, Egyptian love spells and rituals, Egyptian revenge spells, and Egyptian prosperity magic. And I'm also the author of my first novel, The Wrath of Amun, which is a historical mystery set in ancient Egypt. I see a theme here. <laughs> yeah. And you told me also that you have sent another off, uh, another novel out to be considered by a publisher. What is this, you know, as yet I, unknown, whether it's um, who and where? <laughs> I have. The title of that one is The Talisman of Tehuti. It is the second novel in the Egyptian mystery series. Uh, same publisher as the first novel. Uh, it's currently with my publisher, so he's reading it and seeing what he thinks. We're hoping to, if he likes it, we're hoping to have it out before the end of the year. Wow, that's nice and quick, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I work with a small independent publisher. And the nice uh -huh. thing is he can do it much faster than a larger publisher. <coughs> And the other thing is it comes out not only as a print version, but as an electronic download as well. The e-book thing, you know, um, I have yeah. to admit, my family has become recently enamored of the whole e-book thing. I've been looking in series <laughs> Amazon, Kindle versus uh, books, or Barnes & Noble, uh, mm -hmm. their Nook books. Yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, there's a number of independent ones either. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's pros and cons with Sony e-reader too. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, ones that aren't associated with either Barnes and Noble or uh, or Amazon, and sort of hit wow. the whole gamut of, of options. Um, you know, and and I f I find it fascinating because now I I have lots and lots of books. We're in the process of moving. And, you know, we loaded an entire trailer full of 
that's just the books that I had to have out where I could yeah. get at them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know. Um, now, granted, it wasn't a very big trailer, but that's still, I kind of went, oh, you know, because it, it's kind of ridiculous. I probably have more books than many small town libraries. <laughs> so that's kind of shameful in a way because there's just the two of us to read them and the occasional friend who borrows a book. Um, you know, so it is, you know, somewhat shameful, I suppose. Um, no, so. you're, ta you're talking to, so I, can, I will admit on the phone that I possess a personal library of over 3,500 books. So, yes, I could be my own library, probably. <laughs> so I yeah, know what you mean. Yeah, paranormal books, I've got more. We live in Mississippi now, which is not exactly a mm -hmm. paranormal hotbed. Um, we probably have more paranormal books in the average library because of the fact mm -hmm. that so many of the authors and so many publishers send us books to be considered for for guests mm -hmm. and so forth and so on. And, you know, people want reviews and, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. So we do have an incredibly large collection and it's pretty mm -hmm. diverse because then, of course, I'm fond of how to do it yourself sort of stuff. So I've got books on various things that you do and I've collected cookbooks my entire adult life and mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm my daughter collects them, my mother collects them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um it is yeah. kind of, yeah, somewhat shameful, I suppose. Um, no, it's not. It's a sign that you enjoy reading and you enjoy possessing a book and learning with that. Yeah, so, you know, in terms of, like, the, especially the how-to books and uh, mm -hmm. periodicals, okay, periodicals can become a fire hazard if you tend to keep things to look at, be simply because yeah. of the sheer volume. And... Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then you can never find what you want. Or you throw out the one that had the thing that you did want, and so you spend the rest of yeah. your life looking for that lost recipe mm -hmm. um, or directions for whatever. Um, so, you know, I think that I, I, I know that I really enjoy the e-magazines. And yeah. uh, that's, that's especially a favorite of mine. Um, in the e-books, and it's all, you know, everybody tries to live a little greener, a little lighter on the on the planet and whatnot. Well, yeah. if you have an e-book, you didn't have to cut down trees for each and every book. So I can lighten my load of guilt, you know. Um, yeah. Yes. Now, I'm looking toward, at some point in time, getting all of my books that have no colored plates in them in electronic format. There are some books that, because of their the availability and the fact that they do have color plates, that they I will probably always keep as a hard copy rather than go to the electronic version. But even if I could whittle down my library to 500 books and the rest in a lovely electronic format, that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then, and then of course, all the doomsayers, you know, they're always saying, oh, if something, you know, if the end of the world comes, whatever version that they're, they're, they're worried about, but if the end of the world comes, we're going to lose all of our electronic information. It'll be a disaster, you know, like yeah. the Library of Alexandria. And yeah. that's true, uh, because we do yeah. have an incredible amount of information that mm -hmm. is available only in electronic format. Um, when we migrated our website, we lost the entire site. Um, wow. Now, we had copies of it, but it wasn't like mm -hmm. copy and paste and you've got it all back up and running. No, months yeah. later, we're still recreating it. So, yes. you know, it's a, it's a big project when you're dealing with electronic information. It does happen. Um, you know, it's the same thing for, for authors, I'm sure. When you're writing something and something happens to your, man, you know, your physical manuscript. Yes. You know, there I've you are. Been there. Yeah. I, that happened to me when I was writing my second nonfiction book, Egyptian Revenge Spell. I, at the time, was still using the small three-and-a-half-inch floppies. And I slid a floppy into my computer, and it wouldn't read it. 
and I was fortunate I was able to take it somewhere and they recreated 90% of what was on the floppy. Unfortunately, after what it cost and after learning from the nice man who did this for me, that I really needed to do a couple of things. Number one, I needed to back it up in more than one place because that was the only disc that I had. And he also advised me that I should go to flash drives instead of using the floppies. So now I have probably more flash drives than I will ever use. However, I've learned to keep two independent copies on flash drives, and I also have an external hard drive. So I have three copies of everything at all times. Just so this is a smart lady. Yeah, well, you know, I got hit by lightning two years ago when we first moved to Mississippi. We mm -hmm. lost all of our computers. Um, it actually, the the zap came through the um, oh the cord. I forget what they call it. The cord that runs to the internet. You know, goes to your yeah. modem and and, and yeah. router and all that. It came in through mm -hmm. there, not through because we had. Uh, uh, surge protectors on. Surge protectors, it came, yep. up, it came in through the other wire because we had not upgraded. I didn't even realize they existed, that there is a surge protector that you can run that, that wire through so that you don't get zapped. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that made a huge amount of difference for our, our peace of mind mm -hmm. because for us that was that was a nightmare. Um, you know, uh, the information's locked up. We can't get it out of the mm -hmm. Um you know, we lost incredible amount, and yeah. it, it's frustrating and aggravating and depressing. And I now have backup drives, and have learned don't put all your eggs in one basket, as the saying goes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, the other thing I do, I'm now living in Massachusetts. I was living in Arizona, and we used to have a lot of electrical storms, and Surge protectors are wonderful, but I learned a very valuable lesson, even with a surge protector. When the electric, when we would lose power and the power would come back on, even through the surge protector, it would still be a, a jolt to my system. I have three computers. So what I would do is when the power went out, I would shut off the surge protectors and I would unplug everything. And I would wait until the power came back on before I plugged my systems back in, mm -hmm. which helped prevent me from losing any data. Yeah. And yeah. also frying my memory. So I've right. got uh, attitude now. <laughs> for uh, a lot of people, you know, there's not only the threat of uh, a power surge um, mm -hmm. or electrical strike, you know, a, a lightning strike. But there's also the um, issues of malware and viruses and uh, mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Um, a month or two ago, Greg and I both got hit uh, by something that was feeding through advertisements on a particular website. Mm -hmm. Because, and the only reason we knew that, that was the only thing we had open at the time. Yeah. And all of a sudden... You know, in his case, it didn't happen on the same day. They were actually about a week or ten days apart. And I kind of had poo-pooed his, his incident. And I'm like, no, no way. Took out his sound card. I had a dual processor, and it took out half my mm -hmm. processor. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, it was only half the processor, which means the computer is sort of functional. It's just not functional level that um, I used it without aggravation. Because all of a sudden it had half its processing power. Yeah. So you know you also need to make sure the good firewalls yeah. and and there again the backup thing is important for anything yeah. important. Yeah. Now you know I know that uh, there's a lot of research that, that goes into your books about uh, like your nonfiction ones about the uh, magic mm -hmm. of Egypt. Yeah. You know, do you use the computer primarily to do your research, or do you have to, like, physically go to libraries and dig through musty old tomes? I do a lot of my research by book, actually.
spiritually. I do some online. I am always looking for articles online. Um, and what, and I know this sounds really odd. I say this so often to people. When I pick up a book at the library or if I go to a bookstore and I pick up a book, I don't necessarily open it to the table of contents first. I open it usually to the suggested reading or the uh, bibliography because that usually will lead me to other books or articles or websites now with uh, new books. And that's where I get a lot of current information because a lot of the research that I do involves a lot of very old books. I um, requested on interlibrary loan a three-volume set. It's called the Edwin Smith Papyrus, and it's a large three-volume set of the a, a translation of a medical papyrus from ancient Egypt. And when I got the three volumes at my house, I thought I was going to die of black lung because they were so dusty to begin with. And when I opened the book, the last stamped date that it had been taken out of the library was 1962. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm digging into really old fish. <laughs> But when I do my research into nonfiction and fiction, I do not just accept one authority. I cannot just use one source. It might be an interesting tidbit, but I want to know that I can back it up with a second independent source. So I try never to use just one source. So I'm forever looking for material. It's a daunting task. Oh. <laughs> well, I did read. I read an interesting article. I think it was in the New York Times, but I couldn't be couldn't swear to that mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. But it made me think of you because it was about um, a uh, teeny tiny piece of of uh, a scroll that uh, in which. It was. It's supposed to be a Coptic scroll, um, uh -huh. and I think, if I remember correctly, it dated from about 400 A.D., in okay. which uh, Jesus said that he ha you know, mentions his wife and mentions a female disciple, which is kind of radical Ooh. ideas, you know. So, uh, uh, but well, is it re really a re idea? Because remember. Up until the advent of Christianity, in most of the pagan religions, women had an active role in religious ceremony. You had priestesses. So they were on the same level as a priest. It's only after the advent of monotheism that women were relegated in some cases to a lesser role and in some cases had no role in religious functions any longer. So is it really a radical idea? Because think back to when Christ, if in fact he existed. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm not saying he did. But if in fact he existed, he came from a Hebraic background, and at one point in time, and the, I'm sure any of your listeners who are Jewish would dispute this, at one point in time, the Hebrews were also polytheists and worshipped both male and female deities. So it's not a big shock to think that there might have been women serving in the temple when Christ was a child. That's very possible. <laughs> so yeah, why yeah. would it be why would it be a stretch to think that he would have a female disciple? That's very possible. 
I didn't think it, you know, on a personal level, but I'm thinking in terms of traditional Christian religions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the article indicated that there's a very small chance that it could be a fraud, that this was, in fact, an authentic scroll from the era, uh -huh. and so forth and so on. And, you know, they're still authenticating it and doing what, you know, what people, people that play with those old scrolls do, but... Oh, it's still, yeah. in terms of Catholicism and pro a Protestant mm -hmm. religion, it's still okay. a big deal. It's I mean, about, it's... Yeah. Absolutely it is. But you know what it could be? It could be a Gnostic scroll. And the Gnostics, which the early Christian church had problems with, uh, in the Gnostic followers, women were on the same par as men. And they actually did write a lot of um, gospels that were attributed to women. And they did, in fact, believe that there were female disciples of Christ. So this could be one of the Gnostic writings. And that would that would make perfect sense. <laughs> well, from what I understood, this was a Coptic uh, um, mm -hmm. piece of scroll, and Coptic was a language, it was Egyptian, but they used Greek lettering, and the yeah. particular dialect was from southern Egypt. So I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's, that's Gnostic possible. existed mm -hmm. in that area or not. I really don't know that. I'm not a, a biblical scholar. I'm not an Egyptian scholar. Uh, you know, I, I simply regarded it as an interesting art, and I thought, well, how yeah. curious that I read yeah. this today, and, well, actually, it was, it was published today, and uh, it, you know, has to do with uh, this, this, you know, pretty much forgotten today uh, Egyptian language. Yeah. And so I don't think that, that was the See, that's how... I don't want to say that's how the Rosetta Stone was translated. If I'm not mistaken, the Rosetta Stone had on it hieroglyphic, what was then called heratic, which was kind of a shorthand hieroglyphics. Rather than pictures, they were more, um, it was like a shorthand. Mm. And then the third language was Greek. And if I'm not mistaken, Coptic helped them to translate it because the Heretic was very close to Coptic. So they could take the Greek and they could match it up to Coptic with close to the Heretic. That's how they could translate the hieroglyphic, which oh. is how we learned what the Egyptian language was. The only thing is we don't know how it was pronounced because they really didn't use um, vowels, which a lot of ancient languages didn't use vowels. And I, I'm not on sure footing here, but I don't think um, Aramaic, which is what uh, Hebrew is based on, I don't believe they always used vowels. Because mm -hmm. Yahweh is, if I remember correctly, it's Y H W H. They don't use the vowels. Ah, oh, okay. But you know how to pronounce that if you've learned Hebrew. With ancient Egyptian, we don't know how it was pronounced because there's no one who was alive then, and it wasn't passed. Now. So I uh, take it that the ancient Egyptian language is the root language of the language spoken in Egypt today. Correct, it's not. The root lang the language that's spoken today is Arabic. Mm -hmm, and that okay. was not necessarily based on ancient Egyptian uh, I think a lot of Arabic came from 
it did come from the Middle East, and I'm trying to remember what the language is. That I can't tell you off the top of my head. I would have to look that up. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, the uh. It speaks Arabic in, in, in Egypt now. Okay. Uh, and of course, I'm, you know, I do my best to stay faithful, at least in my novel, to the Egyptian terminology as opposed to what people are more comfortable with which are the Greek translations. When we speak of the gods Osiris, those are Greek words. That's how the Greeks translated the names of the gods. The Egyptian names for Osiris, that would be Osar, A-U-S-E-R, and actually, um, it's I would I would have to look at it specifically. I don't have the see. I don't have the book in front of me. I know it's this in my head, and uh-huh. Isis is Aset, A U S E T. Now there are several different spellings of it because, of course, they didn't use vowels. Um, so when I write my novels, I'm using the Egyptian names of the gods. I'm using the Egyptian names for the cities. We don't go to Thebes, we go to Wasset, because that's what Thebes is called. We don't go to Memphis, and that's definitely a Greek word with the IS ending. We go to Menlefer, which was the Egyptian name for the city. So I try to say it's true what they use after ancient Egypt is awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, uh, that makes absolute sense. Now, when you were writing the nonfiction books about the Egyptian magic, yeah. I have to admit, I really, really like the the Egypt uh the revenge one. Uh the cover, the whole thing just you know, that, that absolutely caught my interest from the beginning. You know, I was like, this is too funny. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was a very cute cover. For, and for anyone who's seen it, um, it shows a picture very similar to what we're familiar with as Egyptian art. But uh, this gentleman has a black eye. And... Uh, you know, we all know that at certain times, uh, all women, it seems, have a uh, moment or two in which the male, uh, the significant male, maybe the spouse, maybe a boyfriend, uh, maybe someone you just started dating, inspires one to sheer fury. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And see, modern paganism, um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but modern paganism doesn't always address revenge magic because Wicca stresses harming none and the law of three. Whatever you send out in the sense of magic will come back to you threefold. So if you're catching someone, the theory is that it will come back to you threefold. And that sounds really awful, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It does. It would scare me. However, if you read the ancient spells, and I'm not just zeroing in on the Egyptians, I'm talking the ancient roots of paganism. They used cursing magic, destructive magic, if you want to call it that, right alongside beneficial magic. Because in their mind, this is not a bad thing. You used to 
carefully, you used it wisely, you didn't just go around hexing people for no reason, but most of the revenge magic, or what a lot of people call pet magic, what most of the ancients used to act for was against enemies in battle. Well, gee, does that make perfect sense? You want to be a strong warrior, you want to overcome this enemy to your country, so what are you going to do? You're not going to do a fluffy spell that says, oh, I love this person, I'm not going to kill them. Wrong. Well, in ancient warfare, you wanted to smite your enemy. So you would call upon the destructive deities. Set, 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 apophis. These are the deities you wanted on your side when you went into battle. <laughs> and that makes perfect sense. Yeah, so, you know, I have to admit that uh, coming back to you thing has always been something that had, had bothered me. And therefore, um, my, my favorite curse, you might say, is a carefully hedged bet. And it's simply may you reap as you've sown. Um, which means, you know, if I'm wrong and you, you really weren't as bad as you came off on, then, you know, you're okay. And if you were as bad, well, may you just reap those benefits, you know, all, all day long. <coughs> and I look at it this way. Egyptian civilization that we are aware of existed for over 5,000 years. If the magic were that bad, would they have existed that long? Apparently, the bad magic didn't come back and smite them, did it? not if they existed for 5,000 years. The other thing that I look at is there are ways to perform a curse that are far more creative than just saying, I curse you, which the ancients did say. They would, they would have a curse that would curse you from the top of your head to the bottom of your face, and they would curse every possible part of your body, and it was terrible. I try it a different way. I generally, and I had this, I had, had someone ask me if there was something I could do. His daughter had been physically abused by her boyfriend, and he said, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, and I don't know what to do. And I said to him, do you want me to do something? And he knows what I am. And he said, if you think it will help, yes, I just want my daughter to be safe. And I said, oh, not a problem. And I constructed a lovely ritual that everything that this young man deserved would come to him. Now, that's not a curse. And sure enough, within a month, he was in jail on unrelated charges because the law had caught up to him. Now, my friend's daughter was safe. She was out of the relationship. She moved on with her life. And this young man had more trouble than he had bargained for. Was it something I did? Maybe my magic helped. Maybe my magic, in a sense, put a spotlight on him. I feel bad that I did this? Absolutely not. <laughs> You know, that's very, very similar to my may, may you reap as you sow. You know, yeah, you know, I think that's exactly that. Right. And there have been people that, for whatever reason, have just wanted to make total grief for me in the past. I mean, is well, I had never done anything to them. I had no intentions of doing anything to them. Not to this day. But I seriously wanted their uh, negative energy to not be directed at me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know, in in that sense, you know, I, I don't feel that I was going to suffer any repercussions for it. Uh, I simply wanted them to just keep it. <laughs> you might say. 
Exactly. Yeah, because you know, like I said, I, I wasn't doing anything to them. There was no reason for them to want to cause me distress in any way. And, and see, I know a lot of people will not practice what are called binding spells or banishing spells. And I have some lovely ways to bind people to their own negativity. And I don't feel that that's a bad thing. They're the negative person. I don't want their negativity intruding on me. So I will, you know, take a representation of that person, whether I form it into a doll, whether I inscribe their name on a candle, whether I write their name on a piece of paper, and I can take that and shove it into a jar of molasses, which will keep them stuck in their own negativity. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's been quite nice to them. Molasses is very sweet. So stay stuck in your, you know, negative way of thinking as long as you don't intrude on my state. I have no problem with that. <laughs> that does make you absolute sense. Yeah. You have to be creative. Yeah, you know, I can right. definitely understand that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's be sweet in a sense. You know, honey works just as well, although I prefer to use honey for... I, I don't like to perform love spells. I know people say, well, why not? They're, they're really popular. Because I don't feel that working a love spell for another person is the right thing to do. I don't know what their intentions are. I cannot know in their heart what they really want. That's something that a person should perform on their own. I don't like necessarily working magic for other people. I do on occasion when my friend, you know, my friend's daughter was in serious trouble. She needed to get out of that difficult relationship. Then, yes. But I will perform healing spells. I have no problem with that. I am very happy to do a healing ritual for And I've done that on for several people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, you know, I, I can definitely understand the uh, issues with the love spells. And, you know, I've watched friends go through their lives continually hopping from one relationship to another. And they're always in love or want to be in love. Yeah. Or, on the occasions when they don't have an attachment with someone, it's and this is mostly women, of course, um, they feel like they are unfulfilled, like they are missing something. They're less of a person. They're, yeah, they're less of a person. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, you're not. You can have fun and a great life and never mm -hmm. be involved. Mm -hmm. You don't have to live with this chaos and this uh, uh, musical chair boyfriend attachment significant other routine. I mean... You just don't have to live like that. But see, they have to be all right with who they are. And right. apparently they're not. Because if they're not happy with who they are, how can they be happy with another person? Exactly. Yeah, and now Greg and I are still technically newlyweds. We don't have our, our first anniversary, you know, anniversary of our wedding until mm -hmm. next month. But... At the same time, so yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, we've been friends and, and living together and whatnot for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about the relationship, um, you know, it's a very positive one in my eyes because it's mutually supportive and it's, it's got all the positive things. Was I ready for it uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago? Probably not. You know, in order to be involved in a relationship that is positive in nature, 
I think you have to reach a certain level of maturity. Not everybody reaches it exactly. at 16, 18, 20, 25, whatever number you want to pick. Sure. You know, we, we all arrive at that state at a different point in our lives. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's it's just, that's the way it is. You have to learn to love and self before mm-hmm. you can do the same oh, with yeah. anyone else. Well, recently a friend of mine said that um, he felt that in a marriage specifically, in a, as he put it, a legally binding relationship, that one party dominates the other, and most often it's the woman dominating the man. And I said, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. I said, because I always envision a relationship as being mutually supportive. A man has strength that a woman does not. A woman has strength that a man does not. So why don't they rely on each other's strength? And to be a partnership, isn't that what a legally binding relationship is supposed to be? And I got no response. Because apparently, the legally binding relationship that he apparently is in is not a partnership. <laughs> in my opinion, that's what a marriage or any relationship should be. It should be a partnership. You yeah. share responsibility. And, you know, I'm not talking about, well, if she does the laundry, he does the dishes. You know, you work out the mundane stuff. I'm talking about, you know, practical life. Maybe he's better at handling money, so he handles the finances. However, she needs to be involved in it as well. You can't exclude the other party from these types of decisions. And I know women quite frequently are much better at handling telephone calls, insurance companies, you know, the things that sometimes men are not as good at. Women are good at uh, multitasking. Not all men can multitask. Use your strengths in a relationship. That's what it should be. Apparently this one isn't, and that's too bad. (laughs) Yeah, you know, I've, I, and I'm sure all people have done this. They look around them at their friends and, and their spouses and they go, oh, my God, how can they stand each other? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a reason why you're not involved with that person beyond the friendship level or, or you know, the relationship level. Because sometimes it's a, a family member. <clears throat> and we do. We look at each other people's relationships and we go, how do they stand each other? Or maybe one is uh, more aggravating than the other, in in our opinion. Well, they must be doing something that the other one likes, because many of these relationships that make you go, how can they stand each other, last for decades. Yeah. Far longer than the so-called perfect relationship. And in addition, I already know from, from personal experience, no one knows from the outside looking in what is good yeah. or bad about a relationship or even what state it's in. Yes. And I've always believed that there is someone who is in that. I believe in that happy ending. And I'm sure that there is someone out there for everyone. The, unfortunately, we may not find that person. And... You know, so then unfortunately your life is diminished a bit by not having that person who can complete you. Does that mean that you, you know, have lived a terrible life? No. You enjoy life. You make the most of what's given you. You know, you don't bemoan the fact that you're single or that you can't keep a relationship. You haven't found the right person. You may never find that right person. But enjoy life. You know, don't don't bemoan that fact. Don't look at the negative. Look at the positive. You have a lot to do. 
Well, I looked at it because I spent most of my life signal, obviously, and you know, I, I called my I, I, I regarded it all with humor. I called myself the queen of the six month relationship, and said that many of my dating experiences were simply fodder for good, funny stories. Um, because oh, did we have some good funny stories? Uh, <laughs> and you know some. You know, as the saying goes, dates from hell. Oh, um, I actually did use uh, online dating services, and um, I used them actually one time as research for an article I was writing, but uh, which that was kind of wicked, perhaps. But you know, it was you know I was I was totally legitimate in what I was doing. It's just that I was somewhat spurred on by the fact that I was going to write this article about it. Okay. And, you know, I know her, I've heard a lot of people say that only absolute losers in online dating services. The reality is is that most people meet their um, prospective partners or someone to date or, and friends and whatnot okay. via work or church. Okay. Well, I... Uh, I was. I'm not a church goer, so that was you know automatic okay. out. Um, mm -hmm. Bars are another place. Well, I'm not much into the bar scene, and at work I didn't. I wasn't going to meet anybody. Uh, I worked with dogs. Okay, little four-legged wolf, wolf dogs. You know, I, I wasn't into dating dogs, <laughs> so um, that left. We're going to have to find another avenue, and. Mm -hmm. I met a lot of people that are still friends to this day. You know, dating wasn't an option, uh, but they did become good friends. And their eventual spouses or significant others became good friends. But So I don't regard it as a total loser thing. Um, I just really, I had some hilarious experiences with it uh, because people often, they don't, Pay attention is what I've noticed. Mm -hmm. And so people are yeah. meeting entirely entire losers online, you know, through a dating service. Um, maybe they're not reading everything about that person before they, they go through all the steps, mm -hmm. which you know, yeah. you start off like you know, conversing within the system and then you, you progress mm -hmm. to email and then phone calls yeah. and then you meet in a public place and so forth and so on. Because you do have to be careful. There are nuts in the loose in the world. Absolutely. And so, you know, you go through all of this, and, and the person was dishonest in what they wrote about themselves. Um, obviously, you're going to get a surprise. And if the person didn't read about you, didn't pay attention, and was too eager to please and overlook things, yeah. they may find that you're a real big surprise to them. And not in a good way necessarily. Uh, so it's, you know, it's interesting. Okay, it was it was really interesting. I did meet some people that became long term friends, and I met some people. that was like, oh please, never let me run into them again. Um, so it's just like you know the people you run into at work or anyplace else. You ran into some winners and you ran into some losers. I was just going to say that you can run into them anywhere, not necessarily online dating. Yes. You know, how many, when I was young, yes, I did the bar scene, and I met a lot of losers. I'm sure I could meet just as many online. Uh, you know, it's very simple. So, mm -hmm. but you do, you have to be careful, and you have to pay attention. And sometimes there are immediate red flags. And, you know, you see a picture and you're like, oh, oh he's going to just wrong. Read. Yeah. Look at what they're saying. You know, looks are as, and I always remember this line. I think she used it as the title of a book. Um, Judge Judy Ch Shine one. Um, Looks fade, stupid is forever. And you know why? She's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, and, and there again, all, you know we, we know people who chose a stupid spouse. One that was genuinely... Or an, 
And let's say an incorrect spouse. <laughs> well, no, I'm talking about people that are legitimately intellectually challenged. Ah, where, okay. you know, they cannot have a conversation about much of anything. Mm -hmm. You know, day-to-day -day life is challenging to them. And so they go through a long-term marriage, and they have children with this particular person. And in my case, it's been mostly male friends, their, their wives that I've observed this with. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the kids grow up, and their kids are equally intellectually challenged. Mm -hmm. And the person is bemoaning the fact that they don't have children that are very bright, either mm -hmm. in terms of books or common sense. And I, I scratch my head and I wonder, I'm thinking, the person you chose, their other parent, mm -hmm. is about as smart as the average rock. And you wonder why the children took after them. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. I'm, glad I'm, not, I'm not, you know, planning a family or anything. Um, but, you know, the whole thing is, is that at the end of the day, who do you converse with? Your spouse. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and you need to have on the same intellectual plane. If you've chosen a spouse that you know, a much lower intellectual level, number one, what do you talk about? And why, you know, why do you then wonder why, say, 10 or 15 years down the road, this person no longer stimulates you, and I'm not talking sexually, I'm talking the fact that you're bored because there is nothing there to talk about. Because let's be realistic, if you're going to spend the rest of your life with this person, don't you want to share things with them? How right. can you share with them if they don't understand what you're sharing? That doesn't make sense to me. I want someone who, you know, as a partner, I want someone who I can talk to on an intellectual level, on a variety of subjects, not just one. Yes, so to talk about something besides household expenses, what do you want for dinner, what mm -hmm. happened today at work, uh, phone okay. messages, you know. Um, mm -hmm. If you can't go beyond that uh, you know, then then there's going to be an issue. And so often, you know, when we were talking about love spells earlier, <coughs> the people that I've seen that, you know, are seem highly likely to want such a thing, it's a case of infatuation. They are infatuated with a single facet of the person. I regard people as having many, many facets. None of us see mm -hmm. all of the facets at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it just doesn't happen. I know that I have friends that are completely ignorant of other facets of my life. I mean, completely ignorant. Mm -hmm. uh, people that know me that don't even know that I do a radio show or, you know, know that I have a particular interest or hobby or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, we're talking about close family members. Trying to explain to my father that my father didn't even know who I was. It's not that he did you know, he was around, you know. He knew when I was born, what I looked like, you know. But if you had asked him, what's her favorite color, what's her favorite food, what does she like to do for fun, he would have had no clue how to answer that. I mean, absolutely none, because he never knew who I was as a person. He knew who I was as his daughter, but that was... And she found that absolutely an almost incomprehensible idea because her and my relationship was so radically different from that that, yeah. you know, it was. It was just she couldn't even imagine it. <coughs> so, you know, um, we do tend to uh, uh, show certain facets to certain people. And it's yeah. nice when... Uh, you can share those facets with um, your spouse. Oh, certainly. But I think a lot of times, especially in the beginning of a relationship, 
there are things that you hide from that person because you're not comfortable yet with that person because you don't know how they will react, say, to um, something that you tell them. Well, let's be realistic. As an author, the light is out there. When I first meet someone, if they don't know that I'm an author, and the first thing I say is, I'm an author, if they say, what do you write? Well, gee, the cat's going to be out of the bag, so to speak. So now, all of a sudden, they're presented with the fact that I write about paganism. So, therefore, I probably am a pagan. And yes, in fact, I am. So that's going to turn a lot of people off. So now do I come right out and tell people that I'm an author? Well, all they have to do is Google me and they're going to know. So I'm upfront with people. Does that mean it's going to turn a lot of people off? Yes. And I've had that happen. I think we all know if you're involved in anything a little uh, left of, uh, the, you might say, the American mean, at least for Americans. Mm -hmm. But it is time for us to take a break. So, folks, while we're away from our computer, you type uh, Claudia Dillaire into the uh, computer and see what you find in your handy-dandy search engine. <laughs> and we'll be back in just a few minutes. Hello everyone, Tree Sheridan, host of A Global Focus. Come join us each Friday evening at A Global Focus's new time, 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Come join the discussion. Hi everyone, I'm psychic medium Christopher George, and I have a new show that will air the first Friday of every month from 11 to midnight Eastern Standard Time. The show is called Insight with Psychic Medium Christopher George. It's all about psychic readings. I welcome my listeners to call in for a free reading. Just remember, don't ask me a question that you really don't want the answer to. I'll give it to you the way the spirits give it to me. Straightforward and real. The first Friday of every month. Insight, 11 to midnight. Hi, this is Rob Simone. Hello, I'm Chip. I'm Nicole. Together we host the Mind Cemetery, where the paranoia about the paranormal comes to rest. We broadcast live every Monday night at 11 p.m. Eastern for two full hours. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook as well as at MindCemetery.com. We cover all the topics you won't hear on your local news. Well, I don't really like watching the news anyway. Then this is the perfect show for someone like you. I wouldn't go that far. After all, I am the skeptic. So you don't believe in ghosts? Nope. UFOs? Yeah, no. How about Bigfoot? Uh, not really. You'll never find a Bigfoot. How about the lost city of Atlantis, then? Isn't that on Google Earth? No? Then forget it. It's never going to get found. Looks like I have my work. Key Catch on Saturday night, 8 p.m. Central, where we will be discussing current events and topics going on in the world today. We have opinions on everything. There's no topic that we won't discuss, and we'll go places that other shows wouldn't dare. False history gets made all day, every day. The truth of the new is never on the news. But you can catch it here, news on the flip side. Only on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. Welcome back. To the dawn of shades. I'm your host, Gia Scott, and tonight we're talking with Claudia Delaire. So, Claudia, before we get started on our wandering conversation, would you be so kind as to tell people about your books, what the titles are, and where they can purchase them? Certainly. My name is Claudia Delaire. I am an author. All of my books are available on Amazon. Um, and I'm sure, let's see, I know the novel can be ordered directly through the publisher, Pen Drive 
Publishing, T E N C R A I G Publishing. Um, it is also available as a download on Smashwords and the Wrath of Amun is a historical mystery set in ancient Egypt. And my three non-fiction books are, as I said, available on Amazon, Egyptian Love Spells and Rituals, Egyptian Revenge Spells, and Egyptian Prosperity Magic. Hmm, okay. <coughs> That's quite a variety <laughs> of uh, magic books. Yeah. And uh, then with some novels thrown in, you're assembling yourself a very nice portfolio. I hope so. I, I love to write. This is not just one. I hope to make it my career. And it, it takes a while to get established, so that's you know, not a problem. I've got time. But I also believe in not sticking in just one genre. I know a lot of people do, and I think that's wonderful. But I believe in trying different things. So um, I am planning to write another nonfiction book, uh, also about Egyptian magic. Um, I'm working on my fourth Egyptian mystery novel. I have also charted out a series of fantasy novels about the destruction of Atlantis. And I'm actually writing a contemporary romance. <laughs> so I try a little bit of everything. Yeah, you're a busy, busy lady. Um, <laughs> You know, and I know you also do freelance work, and a lot of people, they, you know, they say, oh, they're an author and a freelance writer. They must be rich. No. <laughs> we will. Well, I know that. Because I, I know a number of authors. I know that you're not going to get rich with a, a book, and uh, not even with several books. But, you know, and, and what kinds of things does a freelance writer really even do? Well, right now what I'm doing is I freelance as a copy editor and a proofreader. So, and the uh, publisher that I actually work, I can't say I work for them. I'm one of their freelancers. They have several. Uh, is Adams Media. And they publish, among other things, they do uh, books and they do magazines. Primarily what I do is I do proofreading and copy editing on manuscripts. I'm working on a project right now for them. Uh, and they publish the Everything Guides, which are like the Dummies book. Mm -hmm. And I just I think it's wonderful. I get to see what other people are writing. And I, because it's what I love to do, this is, this helps me supplement my income, and it's wonderful <laughs> because I can work at it at home, and I, you know, I can work at it at my own speed. And they give me the time frame they need it in, and they will have it. Everybody's happy. So when I know that I've read a number of proof copies and uh, mm -hmm. even some finished copies. That have typographical mm -hmm. errors, strange spellings, and you kind of go through the oh, entire book. Yeah. And I'm like, is, is Clue really spelled C L E W? Uh, uh, in old British novels, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so since this was a historical novel that I was reading, it's possible that it was deliberately done that way. Um, Correct. But, because I was, like, scratching my head. I'd never encountered that spell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, see, the, the person who does the work, um, I know Adam's Media is wonderful about doing this. If they have words that they want spelled a certain <clears throat> way, they give me a list of their word list, the publisher's word list. But on mm -hmm. each project, if there are words 
that are specific to that project that they want a certain way, they send me a work list, which makes my life a whole lot easier. And that way you can keep consistency throughout the book. And that is very important. It's kind of jarring. I've read books where something is, and I will use this word as an example, the word email. If you hyphenate the word so that it's e hyphen mail, I don't have a problem with that. But if two pages later you have it as all one word email, or you don't have the hyphen, or you've capitalized it, I find that very jarring. It should be consistent through the whole book. And that's the job of the copy editor and the proofreader. Well, it makes, well, you know, the, the whole do. thing makes sense. I, I, you know, a long time ago, in a previous incarnation during this lifetime, I was a police dispatcher in a small town. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. meant that I typed up police reports. A lot of them, yeah. as well as transcribed interrogations. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was a really good transcriber um, because I, I was pretty good about being really accurate and quick. And uh, investigators knew that, so they would often give me the, the uh, tapes to transcribe mm -hmm. them for them. But, you know, some words, it's not like you could look them up in the dictionary. You know, I had to decide mm -hmm. how is uh-uh-uh spelled versus uh-uh, or uh-huh, uh -huh, you know, uh, mm-hmm, or uh-uh, or, mm, you know, all these strange sounds that we mm -hmm. make, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, how, how are they spelled? Well, it had to be consistent so that whoever we were saying to, <coughs> in other words, that were specific to uh, the field of law enforcement, like intoxilizer, mm -hmm. okay, it was, at that time, this was a long time ago. Intoxilizer wasn't something you could find in a dictionary or spell check. Oh. How is it spelled? Well, you had to decide how it was going to be spelled, and then you had to spell it the same way over time. And, you know, any field has words that are field-specific, and they may be spelled very peculiar. Um, you know, you have your own particular jargon. Like, I used to show dogs. My daughter grew up going to dog shows. When you're at a dog show, there are two basic classes for each breed, bitch and dog. Therefore, bitch was a word she heard in common usage. It meant female dog or canine, female canine. Um, so, you know, and she even understood if somebody said, oh, that's a doggy bitch or a bitchy dog, you know, you were, you were saying something specific that people who are familiar with the jargon understood. Fortunately, going to school, the public school system, um, you know, when you bring up, oh, you know, we have a, a bitch in heat at home, she was soon in trouble. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we had to, you know, have a discussion about, okay, the, some words we can't use just every place because people don't understand what we're saying. Um, you know, it's it's a vocabulary thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, trying to explain that that to, you know, your, your seven-year-old can be intriguing mm -hmm. at times. Mm -hmm. well, but there is jargon that is specific to different fields. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny you say that because when the two female dogs this summer were in heat, I was writing to a friend of mine, and apparently he has a filter on his email, and certain do not go through, and I was trying to send him an email telling him about our dogs, and I had said how, you know, the, the bitch was in heat, and the email kept coming back to me. I couldn't find it, until I realized the word specifically, was causing the email to come back to me. When I changed the email, it went through. So, again, we don't think of it because it is a, a field-specific word. It is a proper word that's used in dog show circles. And it's a proper word if you look it up in the dictionary. But guess what? 
<laughs> those those long emails are going to pick it up. <laughs> right, you know, so you, you can be entirely correct in your usage of language and mm -hmm. inadvertently offend somebody. Or, like you said, yeah. encounter the filtering, you know, because this automated mm -hmm. filtering doesn't understand the difference in usage. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So, yeah. You know, if you have donkeys, you can quickly be in trouble. Yes. Uh, but this is, and, you know, it's funny when you said, you know, people think, I get this a lot when I say to people that I'm an author, they automatically think that all I do is sit home all day and dream up stories to write. If only that were true, we all work. We all just work very mundane jobs, and we write when we can. And some of us do freelance work, like I do, and we hope to make a living at it. Um, we dream of being rich, but the sad reality is most of us will probably work until we retire, and we'll continue to write after we retire, and we'll collect our Social Security and what we get, you know, may buy us groceries every month. That's about it. <laughs> yeah. It's a sad reality. So we don't always do it for the money. We do it because we love it. And for me, I don't know what I would do if I couldn't write, because I do love it. So... It's yeah, you know, and, and uh, writing has changed so much, too, in, in terms of the physical aspect of it. I almost mm -hmm. never handwrite anything anymore. Mm-hmm, yeah. I find that when I do have a pen and paper in my hand, it feels awkward mm -hmm. uh, shaping the letters and stuff. The things that I, you know, because I, I used to, to write without, by hand, without a second thought. And yeah. now it does. It really feels kind of awkward. Um, mm -hmm. Now I have trouble with my right arm, and I'm right-handed, so you know perhaps yeah. that's part of my awkward feeling. Sure. Um, but you know, we as a nation as a whole, we don't write anymore. I don't get letters from my mother. I get text messages and emails. Yeah. Yeah. I don't get letters from my daughter or anyone else. I get you know mm -hmm. Facebook messages, text, book, text, yeah. my, my phone. Yeah. Um, you know, the uh, uh, the emails, I mean, they're just quicker. And, yeah. you know, I make jokes about, you know, I'm one with my keyboard. I can type mm -hmm. almost as fast as I talk. Yes, yes. And yet, when we text or email someone, we use shortcuts. We don't say, how are, A-R-E, you. Y O U. How the letter R and the letter U. This isn't writing. <laughs> well, and I, admit, I rarely use the shortcuts, and part of it is uh, sure. it became a bad habit, you know, because there's different mm -hmm. types of emails too. There's emails that you send to your 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 buddy, and then there's emails mm -hmm. that you send for more business like. Yeah. Yeah. And if you start being sloppy in one before long you're sloppy everywhere and as far as text messages go my mother doesn't speak text texties well uh, so you know I have a smartphone and, and it actually will auto complete words sometimes it's correct um, and you choose between several versions so it doesn't mm -hmm. you know everybody makes jokes about how the iPhone uh, you know autocorrects things and really messes yeah. it up um, I haven't had that experience. And we even have where you can talk to text. So that's oh. quite interesting. I, I love the text for us. You look at it oh. and you wonder, what on earth could this person possibly have said? <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. I got one today and I'm like, I know that's not what it said. This was a business call and, and I needed to uh, confirm a reservation. And... You know, I looked at it, and it, it made absolutely no sense. 
Now, part of it is these text to uh, or these these speech to text things fail to account for even American dialects. And you know, I live in Mississippi, so obviously I get a lot of Mississippi voicemails that are translated into text. Cool. It cannot do a southern drawl. <laughs> yeah. It will really, really mess it up. Uh, because it'll be strange oh, words sure. in there. Where on earth oh, this come sure. from? So it is it, yeah, it's all in great I... credit. Oops, you're breaking up. Uh, I'm sorry about that. You're as clear as a bell no. here. Oh, that's better. Now you sound okay. okay. Yeah, you know, I find it well, great humor in these strange text messages and translations of voicemail. Mm-hmm. And uh, is it right to do it that way? Not really, but, you know, have you ever used these programs that you can essentially talk to your computer and it types it out for you? Well, I would say that because I've purchased Dragon speak. Dragon naturally speaking, I think it's called. And I, since I've been moving, I just recently got my desktop computer out here. And I'm hoping in the next month to match up computer and software because they're in different locations right now. And I do want to try it. The only problem that I'm afraid of is a lot of the words that I use in my novel may not translate well, so I may need to enter them individually when I'm setting up the program because I do believe you can do that if there are certain words that you use specifically. I need to get into the program to find it out. But I'm assuming it's probably like with the dictionary in my computer. When I write my novel, of course, all the names that I use are Egyptian. And my computer does not like them. (laughs) And they make suggestions that sometimes are very bizarre. Yeah, I, I, I know what kind of things I get from using word processing software, and I'm not using any particular strange words. You know, they're all, you know, in English. Um, yeah. Names it does absolutely have a fit about because, you know, where I work with so many people in the paranormal field, there's often quite unusual names. And it doesn't like anything beyond the John and Jane and Matthew and Mark sort of simplicity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, my um, my my main character's name is Ka, Q A A. The computer didn't like. No, so oh, it wanted put a U in there. Oh, it wanted me to do a lot of strange things with that. So what I did is I just added it to the dictionary. So now every time I type his name, I don't get a little squiggly red line that's telling me, we don't like that word. So I may have to do the same with dragon speak. And I hope that it will understand when I do speak and say the name Ka, that I don't get car or card or, you know, any of, probably 300 other words that it may think. <laughs> uh, right. Well, I did buy that program over 10 years ago, and I did try it. Uh, yes. For me, it was not very effective because um, the amount of time I'm devoted to training it, I felt, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sure that it's improved a great deal since then. Yes, they have. They've done a lot of improvements on it. I'm hoping it will help me, and I know this sounds really odd, to gain a larger output in my writing. As if, you know, I'm not writing enough, uh, I'd like to be able to write more. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm hoping that it will do for me. So we shall see. Well, you know, there's uh, apparently, you know, even writing has its own set of jargon and tools. 
and mm-hmm. accessories and so forth yeah. and so on. And a lot of people don't realize that a writer actually uses pen and paper. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, we do. Now, I am a purist. A lot of times I do still write with pen and paper. And people think, how barbaric is that? But for me, it's a process. I, when I then take those, sh- those sheets of paper and enter it into the computer, that's my editing process. Because that's when I pick up the mistakes that I've made. Mm-hmm. However, I am finding that more and more I do my writing by typing directly into the computer. So I am getting away from the the paper and pen, but I still try to do that from time to time because I want to to keep that process. Mm -hmm. It's something that I do feel comfortable with. But I am doing more and more on the computer. That's why I'm hoping maybe Dragon will help me to, you know, get a larger output. That would be really beneficial. Now, another thing that most people have heard about a great deal is what's commonly referred to as writer's block. Have you oh. ever experienced it? No. But, and I always like to say but, in some ways I don't believe that that exists. I think what happens is a lot of people get so wrapped up in thinking that they can't write, that then it kind of compounds itself and then they really can't write. I don't believe in writer's block. And I have been stuck. I will say that. Part of it was there was a lot of other things going on in my life. When I was writing my third novel, which currently is unpublished, that obviously comes after book two. Uh, which is the one that's under consideration right now. But when I was writing book three, I had gotten to a point in the book where literally, even though I have an outline, I literally didn't know where to proceed. So what I decided was the book needs to sit while I think and rationalize out why this isn't working. See, that's my theory. It's not that you have writer's block. It's not that you don't know what you want to write. There's something in the book that's preventing you. And sure, part of it was there was a a scene that I had written that just didn't work. So when I continued on with scenes after that, it just, it didn't seem to flow. It didn't make sense. And when I went back and started from the beginning and read the book from beginning to where I had stopped, then I could see it. And I said, oh, no, this will never do. When I rewrote that scene, then I was able to write again. So I don't think of that as writer's block. There was a problem with the book. It wasn't me. I had just written mm-hmm. a crappy scene. <laughs> and it well, I know that you know, in class <laughs> situations, you know, where, where, you know, I was taking a class perhaps on you know, creative writing or, or composition mm-hmm. or whatever. Yes. You would say, oh, I get that piece of paper, and, you know, keep in mind this is a day or two ago when we actually wrote it on paper. Um, mm-hmm. You get that blank piece of paper, and I just, I can't, I can't seem to get started. And, oh, yeah. you know, they they just sit there and they'd stare. You know, it was they always wanted to start off and sound fantastic. I figured if I had mm-hmm. something on the paper, that was better than nothing. Even if ultimately yeah. I ended up, you know, drawing lines and, and rewriting that page mm-hmm. uh, and eliminating mm-hmm. something or changing it or whatever, if I had something down, I was a step ahead of that blank page. Exactly. And see, where I write my novels, each one of my Egyptian mystery series, I've already outlined a total of 12 books. 
I've written the first three. I'm currently writing book four. Now, when I say outline, I'm not saying that I have, you know, page after page of an outline. I have literally two sentences as to what the book is about, a list of characters, because they're already named their ages, because I have to age progress. They don't all stay to 20. That's another thing that bugs me when you have a series. And the people have never seem to age. No, my characters age. <laughs> but all I literally have is a basic outline. Um, there's a, a worker strike in the Valley of the Kings. Um, a man is found, you know, the, the, um, the overseer is found dead. I can write a book around that. No problem. But that's all I have right now. And that will be one of my subsequent books. I don't need a big outline. However, when I start a book, and I've had people say, do you start the book at page one? Some of my novels I have. I know exactly what the opening line should be. And those I've started at the beginning. One of my books, I started with a scene. For some reason in my mind, perfect scene. And I wrote the scene, and I looked at it, and I said, what led up to that scene? People need to know, because this is not the opening event. So then I had to go back in time to fill up to that scene. And then I realized, oh, this scene is not the end. And that became one of my novels. So it doesn't matter where you begin a novel. But you have to make it rational. They, you know, I, I've read enough books on writing where they say you always want to start in the middle of things. Well, that may be all well and good, but you don't, don't want to confuse the reader either. So if I have the perfect scene, I will write it down. Will that become the opening scene? It may, but it may not. And you have to look at what you want to accomplish and say, is this really the opening or do I need to give them a little more information? Well, that um, makes absolute sense. It's all You know, and I know I've read some books that were written as standalone books, apparently, uh, because a, a, oh. a sequel has never come out. When it's all done, mm -hmm. you're like, well, what happened next? Yeah, you know, how did this happen? And see, each one of these novels is a standalone novel. However, they do literally build on the novel before. They do make reference to things that happened in the other book. But you could very easily just pick up any one of the novels and understand them. So you don't necessarily have to read all of them. And I had planned it that way. I want people to see, yeah? See what? I want people to see the book and say, oh, this sounds interesting, and pick it up and read it. If they like it, then they may want to pick up the others. If they don't, they've just had a wonderful story to read, and that's fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so often, too, people, you know, think, and I know a number of people like that, they think they have to always be serious. They're never mm -hmm. lighthearted about anything they do because it's all incredibly mm -hmm. important, even to mm -hmm. the novels they read. Okay, yeah. I'm not a huge fan of romance novels, but mm -hmm. there are times when I want something lighthearted to read. Mm -hmm. Um it happens to be that one of my favorite lighthearted authors happens to be Piers Anthony. And he has okay. an incredible series of uh, uh, of fantasy novels that, even mm -hmm. though they're decades old, still work just as well today as they did the first time I read them. Absolutely. And that is the sign of a good author. If you can pick up a book it was written 30 years ago 
and you read that and you finish the book and it's like, oh, wow, that's the sign of a good author. Yeah. Because, you know, when you read something that's 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 100 years old, is it sounding dated? Well, it depends what the book is. Um, but when you have Frankenstein, Dracula, these are classics. They're classics for a reason. Even though they are from a different period, you read the book and you still go, wow, when you finish it. And that's the sign of a good author. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, you know, I have a couple, it, it, I'll admit that uh, sci-fi, fantasy sort of books are what I go to when I want something light and relaxing and pleasant to read. And, mm-hmm. you know, I have a couple of favorite authors, and I've read most of their books numerous times. Um, yes. Simply because it is something I enjoy, even though I know the story, I know it, how it's going to uh, mm-hmm. end. It's not going to be any surprises. Um, you know, the uh, it's just I enjoy it, and it doesn't have yeah. to be important. No, you know, um, I'm doing this for enjoyment, relaxation. Exactly. Um, just the same reason someone would watch a movie. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite authors is Earl Stanley Gardner. And he wrote the Perry Mason series of novels. And I've read almost all of them. They're short, they're concise, and, you know, nowadays we adore, and, you know, sometimes it can be really very... um, shocking to read some of, of what is being written now. With an Earl Stanley Gardner mystery, you have a murder, but you don't have all the blood and gore, which, you know, you really don't need. Sometimes it's just in there for the shock value. I don't really need that. So I really enjoy these. And you know he was writing these in the 30s, so you get that feel, the ambiance of the 30s. And he writes so well that even today, when you read one of these novels, it's like, oh, you can just picture 30s L.A. And it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh-huh. that, that who was an inspiration when I decided I wanted to write mystery fiction. Because he could write a mystery, he could keep your attention, but at the same time, it wasn't in your face. And I don't want that in your face that sometimes you get with modern novels. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's my (laughs) The, uh, The idea that we have to only do things that are important and serious is sometimes Mm -hmm. a little bit overdone yeah you know that we do need lighthearted things enjoyable things mm-hmm. yeah and to just work with that mm-hmm. and uh, you know most of us are going to have favorite authors that we turn to when we are uh, wanting something relaxing um mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's funny you mentioned the 30s. You know, when, when 30s was the era of the Great Depression. In my entire life, I've really pictured people going around wearing dark clothes and, you know, standing in soup lines. And, and uh, everybody was burned, depressed and sad. And you know, I know better. You know, intellectually, I know better. I know about the family stories that are told from that era. Um, people weren't going around any more sad and depressed than they do today. And they are today. Less so. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, things weren't all dark. The sun still shone. The birds still flew. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, so forth and so on. And uh, it's in how we 
mentally picture times and places. Like you know, when, when you mention Egyptian anything, people picture mm -hmm. the pyramids. They picture yeah. people like they're be depicted in the uh, artwork from that same era. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the strange eyes, the uh, yeah. heavy headdress and so forth, and the goofy clothes. Yeah. And I'm sure mm -hmm. people didn't look like that then. That is the stylized version. Actually, actually, yes. A lot of the clothing that's depicted in tomb paintings and, and temple walls, they have actually found remnants of. In, uh, they found a lot of clothing in touch tomb, which did help. But yes, they actually did wear this clothing. So but the depiction in the artwork see are uh, very accurate. In the artwork, it's often depicted as though it was incredibly stiff, like practically wood. Mm -hmm. No, in fact, it was... Uh -huh. in the, oh, you know, yeah. Like anybody else would have worn in that time frame. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of it was better woven than others. You know, obviously, oh, if you were rich, you could afford finer cloth than if you were a poor sure. person. Sure. Uh, but, you know, you some of it look to the clothing and uh, the headdresses. I'm sure... Mm -hmm that they were much more comfortable than what... They, they didn't always stand that, that ramrod straight with one leg in front of the other. Well, no. But part of that is because the artists back then were unfamiliar with how to show the concept of depth. So everything was sideways and stylized. So if you had one foot in front of the other, in their mind, that showed walking because they didn't know how to show it any other way. Uh, but some of the clothing was a bit stiff because one of the things that was very important, and it was also a sign of uh, how wealthy you were, was if your clothing was pleated, then they knew how to pleat clothing. They had a wooden device that you would lay the fabric in and then you would put another wooden device over it, which would pleat the fabric. So this was, you know, this was a sign that you were a somebody. So, you know, some of this, you know, is actual, you know, a, a good depiction. Of course, some of it isn't. Uh, but it's very fascinating to read this because, you know, you would go and to a, a weaver and order a new kilt for a man. He would go and order a new kilt, and he would ask that it be sharply pleated because well, he's a man of status. And I, I find that very fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do try to... Those are things that I try to weave into a novel, which is, you know, telling you a lot about the history of Egypt, but it's in a very conversational and a very fun way and then people, I've, I've had people who know nothing about ancient Egypt read the novel and say, wow, did I learn a lot. Well, I'm, I'm not necessarily doing it to teach, but I just want people to realize that these were real people. It's not the same depiction that we see in the Ten Commandments or the depiction that we have from the Bible which is where a lot of people get their idea of ancient Egypt. These people had real lives, real problems. They weren't, you know, the evil Egyptian overseer that, you know, immediately sometimes comes to mind when you think of the Ten Commandments. Oh, the evil pharaoh. They weren't evil. And this is what I try to impart in my novels. These people were, were human. And I, I want to bring that humanity out. Uh, yeah, well, you know, a lot of times we do attribute things to ancient cultures that mm -hmm. may not be entirely, uh, yeah. because we're imposing our modern ideas on mm -hmm. a much differently developed culture. Sure, sure. 
Oh, yeah, yeah it's, one, it's interesting. And we are one, winding down to towards yeah. the end of the show. Um, you want to tell everybody the titles of your books again? Sure. Uh, three nonfiction books: Egyptian love spells and rituals, Egyptian revenge spells, and Egyptian prosperity magic. And my novel is The Wrath of Amun, A-M-U-N. And they are all available on Amazon.com. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, can you give us a real quick synopsis of The Wrath of Amun? Yes, I sure can. It is about a young military officer who is called back to his boyhood home to solve actually one murder, and on his way there, another suspicious death occurs, and he has been away from his boyhood home. He's been kept away by the king to keep him away from the king's favorite daughter. So once he comes back to his boyhood home, things heat up again in a lot of ways. <laughs> Huh, okay. Yeah. It sounds like you got some mystery, some history, and uh, a little romance. A little romance, yes. Yes. <laughs> yep, it sounds like it would definitely be quite interesting. It, so, was a folks, fun, it was a fun book to write. <laughs> it sounds like it was. And uh, people, you have to go check out those books and... Uh, Buy a couple of them. Yeah. Um, I haven't read The Wrath of Amun yet, I have to admit, but I have read at least two and maybe all three of your dramatic books. Um, um, I'm not sure about that third one, if I read it or not. I'll have to look at my books and see. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's. I thank you very much for coming on. It's been really interesting, as always, to talk with you. But I love coming have. on your show. It's always fun. <laughs> We've run out of time, and it's been all too quick again, folks, but I hope that tonight's program has given everyone plenty of food for thought as well as more illumination for your personal journey towards truth. Tune in again next time as we bring another guest, another topic, a whole new idea for your consideration. You've been listening to the Dawn of Shades, and I'm your host, Gia Scott, and good night. all around this beautiful planet we call Earth. Thanks for being here at the Kevin Smith Show. We're here because you have a right to know, and we're here because you matter. You know, one of the most uh, intriguing and one of the most mysterious kinds